Welcome back to the Art of Argumentation PowerPoint. This is part six as we're nearing the end. This one's just gonna focus on flaws. So as I told you in the last PowerPoint, we've been looking at a lot of skills that could be a strength or weakness, but the end of the PowerPoint is really just about flaws that detract from an author's main conclusion. So let's begin. First off, we have restricting the options, um, which is a flaw that creates a false dilemma, a really strict either or scenario out of a situation that's very, very complex. For instance, when George W. Bush wanted to invade Iraq and the UN was really not in favor of it at all, he came out with the speech saying, you're either with us or you're against us. So it was a really complicated issue where the data was up for debate the pictures of possible weapons of mass destruction was up for debate, and yet he oversimplified it into this either or scenario. You're with us or you're against us. Next, you have flaw of cassation, which is a really common type of flaw, so I wanna make sure that you really understand it. It's basically saying that this occurrence that happened before this other event is what led to it. And flaw of causation is common because it's very hard to prove that just this one factor led to this event occurring. Typically, there's many factors at play. So at times you could say that there's a correlation between this two, but not necessarily a direct causation. So this is when you really have to look out for it because it's very, very common. Then you have slippery slope, which is kind of like flaw of causation, but really extreme, where it takes this one possibility and gives this series of events that will occur in a very negative extreme consequence. If we pass this bill, um, there will be an economic downturn and then people will start rioting in the streets and our government will end as we know it. So this really kind of harsh, severe consequence because of one event. Let's look at examples. I'm gonna take you through three examples of causation because as I said, it's really, really common. And this is one we've seen before. We used it to analyze the evidence. So New York City's Agency for Children claimed that they helped double the rate of adoptions. But when we looked at the year to year, remember that the info was a little differently. So this clearly proved flaw of causation. Yes, the year that they opened and then the year after that, there was a big increase but it was just probably one small factor uh, as we discussed in the sad part of the PowerPoint, there was already an upward trend. So this might be due to economic reasons. Maybe people uh, were wealthier, so they had more money to spend on something like adoption, which can be a really expensive process. So this is one way flaw of causation works. There you see the upper end, and they didn't mention the downward trend. Here's the next example, which is about gun control. And I'm going to show you both sides of the argument about we should have right to carry laws or we should have very strict gun control laws, and they're both going to be using the same flaw. So this side is for right to carry laws. People should be allowed to carry guns. And they're saying that it effectively reduces public shootings. Allowing student, excuse me, citizens to carry concealed handguns reduces violent crime. In the 31 states that have passed right to carry laws since the mid-1980s, the number of multiple victim public shootings and other violent crimes has dropped dramatically. And then they give all these numbers. So because people were allowed to carry guns, crime reduced. That's flaw of causation. Something like crime has so many different components to it. One of it really being economic, uh, police standards, how well they're enforcing things. So just right to carry laws, if they had an impact, it would be really, really insignificant. And then the same flaw can be used for the flip side, for the side that said, no, we shouldn't have more people carry guns, we should have more gun control. So look at this example that says, evidence shows that even state and local handgun control laws work. For example, in 1974, Massachusetts passed the Bartley Fox Law and it explains what it is. Um, and they found that after the law was passed, handgun homicides in Massachusetts fell 50% and the number of armed robberies dropped 35%. So same thing, flaw of causation, because this bill passed, homicide rates dropped when there could be a lot of other alternative explanations. So you notice that I'm using some of the same language from sad, significant alternative explanations when it comes to flaw of causation. And that's pretty typical. As we get to this point in the PowerPoint, we're gonna see some overlap and some of the terms, terms can be used hand in hand. Let's look at another type of flaw. All right, so this uh, is from a paper one passage and it's saying that synthetic biology is a dangerous technology that must not be developed. 
And then in one paragraph, it says this, ultimately synthetic biology means cheaper and widely accessible tools, tools to build bioweapons, virulent pathogens, and artificial organisms that can pose grave threats to the planet. Notice the keyword ultimate, and it gives me this chain reaction of terrible things that could happen. So is that restricting the options or slippery slope? Because it's a series of negative consequences, it's slippery slope. Then we have this one, which is saying we need to do more to preserve endangered languages from dying out. And at the end of the passage, the author says, in the end, then it comes down to a choice. Do we want to live in a monochromatic world of monotony, or do we want to embrace a polychromatic world of diversity? Notice, two stark options. If we don't save endangered languages, we're going to be monochromatic. If we do, then we're going to be diverse. Of course, we should do more to save endangered languages, but if we don't do our fullest potential to do that, that does not mean we're going to be monochromatic. There are already a lot of languages. So this presents restricting the options or slippery slope because it oversimplifies something into an either or scenario. It's restricting the options. And then we have a flaw called circular argument, which is very rare to find in global because this is such a glaring problem. But I wanted to show it to you anyway and give you one quick example. We know the Pope is infallible because God says so. We know that God says so because the Pope has told us so. And the Pope must be right about it because he's infallible. So it just goes in a circle. And you might find yourself in a situation like that when you're arguing with someone and they don't really have a point to get across. And all they're doing is kind of repeating themselves. So their main conclusion is their reason. And their reason is their main conclusion. And it just goes round and around and around. So obviously that's a terrible way to argue anything. You'll rarely see it but I did want to show it to you. Confusing necessary and sufficient is more common, and it's, it's a more of a minute kind of flaw, kind of like conflation, when it confuses something that's absolutely essential with something that is helpful. So the way I explain it is, if I need to study for a test, does studying my textbook, is that going to help me? Is it the only thing I have to do, though? So it might be necessary, but it might not be sufficient. Uh, I may need to study my textbook and also the notes from my teacher's lecture. I might look at, I might need to look at past papers. All of that combined may lead me to succeed, but only doing one of those things, it might be necessary, but not sufficient. So example one, a confused student argues, you can't give me a C, I'm an A student. Notice they didn't get into any of the specifics, the rationales for why they feel that their work was an A. So because of that, it's circular. Next, a few years ago, a number of studies showed that hard work was necessary to genius, brilliance, and success. Many writers argued on the basis of this that young people who showed talent should not therefore be nurtured because it was hard work, not talent, that led to success. So I give you a little clue there, necessary. Is hard work necessary? Of course. Is it in and of itself sufficient? Is only hard work going to get you to succeed? The answer is no. It also takes talent. Sometimes it takes luck. So because of that, this is confusing necessary with sufficient. And lastly, a satisfied citizen says, Richardson is the most successful mayor the town has ever had because he's the best mayor of our history. Why is he the best mayor? What has he done? How's, how has he helped the community or the economy of constituents? It doesn't say. He's just the most successful because he's the best. The conclusion is the same as the reason. Therefore, we have a circular argument. Then we have fallacies. Remember in the last PowerPoint, I said a fallacy is a little different from a flaw because a fallacy is intentional. I'm doing this on purpose. The other ones, I don't really want to do those on purpose. It's just a mistake in my argument. These, I know what I'm doing. And these two are very similar and oftentimes they confuse the students, so I wanted to go over them together. First is a straw man fallacy. A straw man fallacy is when in a debate, maybe I don't really have a strong point to say next or I don't have a strong refutation to my opponent's counter. So I divert attention away from the main debate by bringing up something irrelevant, something that's maybe going to get the audience's attention. Then they'll forget about the fact that I didn't really answer the debate. Uh, but it's a flaw, obviously, because I didn't actually deal with the content of what the argument at hand. Ad hominem is Latin for against the person, against the man. This is a direct attack on the opponent usually on a moral basis. You attack their character. This person is immoral. Maybe they had an affair. Maybe they're very corrupt. We cannot trust them. 
So rather than diverting attention away from the topic, I want to attack the person. Now, obviously, both of these are terrible flaws because you're not dealing with the substance of the argument. So be careful if you find these in counter arguments. Strong counters will not include these kind of fallacies. Strong counters and refutations will use logical premises, strong, uh, well-representative examples or statistics or anything like that to prove why the other side is wrong. They're not going to rely on diverting attention away or attacks. So for instance, my opponent in this election has suggested that cutting business taxes could improve the economy. Do I really need to point out that big businesses have paid for his campaign? Did the arguer actually mention why cutting business taxes would be bad? Is there any kind of rationale given for why that's wrong? No, instead they bring up something that at the surface seems related, but really all it's trying to do is divert attention away to make the person seem like a hypocrite. Because they're diverting attention away instead of directly attacking the opponent, this is a straw man fallacy. This one, my opponent is immoral and corrupt and is thus not fit to represent the people of the state. This one attacks the person's moral character. So this one is ad hominem, unlike straw man. Notice that both, though, don't really deal with the debate at hand, but one distracts, the other directly attacks the person, usually on a moral basis, on their